Let's pray for Ray right now, Lord, that he's delivered from this fear and that God will use him in Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you never turn your back on your children, Lord, and that no matter what we do, you're always there for forgiveness, that you're always there to, to receive us back like the prodigal son. And we ask you, Lord, to be there to bring peace to Ray, take away the fear that the enemy brings and bring faith to replace it and make him a witness for you in Jesus' name. Turn this negative into a positive. Reach the lost through him. Be a blessing, Lord. Take what the devil meant for evil and turn it for good in Jesus' name. And we'll give you all the thanks and the praise for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike, for, for reminding me of that. And uh, thank you for leading worship and uh, yes. thank you. taking care of all the stuff that Mike and Suzanne usually do. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Tammy, for opening. Great job. Yeah. Jody and Tammy for helping to lead us all in worship. And thank all of you for sharing your, your testimonies and prayer requests. Amen. God is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know if you noticed, but Sally was asking me uh, about the, <laughs> it was her birthday was last week, the, the 17th, and uh, I got her a new hearing aid. She, she said, uh, it, was, it, it cost $3,000. And I just asked her, I said, well, what kind is it? And she said, 11 o'clock. <laughs> That's all a lie, praise the Lord. <laughs> Except she did ask me what time it was, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, I like to get the things that she really enjoys, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's start uh, with Gen uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, Mike. And I'll try to move through this uh, as quickly as possible without leaving anything out. Hallelujah. And as always, that what Tammy shared and then everybody's testimonies are uh, going right along with what I have for you this morning. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Welcome everybody on Facebook and uh, the joining us online. We apologize if there's any uh, issues <clears throat> this morning, but uh, this is Mike's first opportunity to work with this soundboard and uh, some of the other devices that we've got here that are new to him that he hasn't worked with yet. And uh, because of Mike and Suzanne not being able to be here. If you weren't able to hear, Suzanne's father passed away yesterday, and that's why they're not here. And so please uh, be patient with us and uh, be in prayer for them and for the family and uh, remember them uh, before the Lord. Praise God. Amen. And God bless all of you for being with us. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, you are a part of this body, regardless of where you are uh, physically. Praise the Lord. So in here it says, uh, Paul speaking, and he said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. To the third heaven, he said. You know, Jesus said, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, which is his word, thy word be done in earth as it is in heaven. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, there are three levels of heaven. Paul t uh, points this out to us. The third heaven is actually where God is. You would say that's where his throne is or that's where he is enthroned. And we know God is everywhere, but I'm talking about the perspective that he gives us. Amen. There is the first heaven, which is the earth or the, the natural realm right here where we are at the atmosphere. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is space, outer, what we call outer space. That's where Satan is. That's where the, 
the dominion of evil uh, still resides. Amen? And then there's the third heaven, which is what Paul's talking about where the Lord is, where he has a physical presence. Amen? And so uh, Jesus says, uh, before Jesus, the Word is who Jesus is. He tells us there was earth and there was heaven. Now, we think about prophets. When, when prophets are speaking, they're speaking from, for the voice of God. They're speaking the word of God on what they've heard from God. That's, I'm talking about if they're legitimate prophets, right? So they're speaking from the third heaven, you can say. When Daniel was prophesying, you know, the angel came to him and said, I had to had a problem because I had to go through the second heaven to get to the first one, and the second one is where the devils were, and that's where he had to battle the prince of Persia and so forth. Well, so there are demonic prophets as well. Uh, CNN. <laughs> uh, MSNBC. I don't care. Shut me off. I don't care. You know, I'm just saying they're, they're lying prophets. There are prophets, and you can, they're, they're speaking for somebody besides God. And we recognize it, most of us recognize it as untruth. So I'm just saying that there's more to this than just earth, the atmosphere, the second heaven, outer space, and then heaven. There's activity taking place in every one of these situations, and they're either for God or they're against God. Amen. So there are demonic prophets the same as there are God prophets. Amen. Amen. That's what Tammy, or that's what Jody is saying. Don't listen. I mean, if you know somebody's a liar, you know, when they start talking, you just kind of turn them off. Even if you don't want to be rude and say, you liar, you just don't listen, right? right? And that's what we need to do. There's nothing wrong with the news. I mean, there's plenty wrong with the news. I'm saying there's nothing wrong with catching up on it occasionally to keep in track, uh, keep up with it. But like Don said, you can, you can uh, look at it to see Okay, who's talking the truth here, and who's just spreading more propaganda and lies? The truth is, though, once you find that out, it's probably a good idea to stay away from the ones that are proper, you know, yep. prophesying the, for the devil. Amen? Trying to get us into fear. Trying to get us into bondage. That That's what that the devil prophesies. That's what he has to say to us. Amen? Yep. And so uh, before uh, there was uh, earth, there was heaven. Amen? There was darkness in the first earth when it was created. There was darkness, there was fear, and there was anxiety. Amen? There was chaos. And then the third heaven, light came from there. It brought sense to everything. It, it, it made everything like it should be. It brought uh, sanity. It, it replaced the chaos with something that was fixed, something that was the way it was supposed to be. You know, I was reading in, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, they have like weekly prayer, or not prayer, but weekly, uh, they have prayer, but weekly Bible reading. And this last week, it was, it was Genesis uh, 1, 1 through 6 verses, and then chapter 8, and then it was... Then you go from there, you go to uh, Isaiah 42, 5, I think it was, or 6, through Isaiah 43, 8. And then from there, you go to Revelation 22, 5 through 21, the last verse. It's amazing, those all fit together. There's the creation. God brings the water together from above and below. He separates it the water above and the water beneath. And then you go and it talks about Noah, uh, evil everywhere, all of man was evil and so on and so forth. And so what does God do? He brings the water back together. He creates another chaos, another uh, destruction. He brings the water back together and puts man in this ark. Well, when you get to uh, Isaiah... It's talking about Jesus. So now we're seeing the real ark, what that ark was pointing to. Deliverance from evil. Right? 
And as long as he was in the ark, everybody, everything was cool. And God kept them in the ark and spared them and, and started a new creation as a result of it, right? Well, when you get to Isaiah, this prophetic word's talking about Jesus is the ark. He's the true ark. He's the ark that we are in. We, have been, we are in him, and he's in us, and we are protected from the evil around us. Because God said he knew, even though he would never destroy the earth again by water, he knew that the intent and the hearts of man was really evil from their youth. So there had to be a way to deliver us, and the only way to deliver us is to recreate us, just like the earth, symbolic of that. So we get recreated, and then he takes us to Genesis or to uh, Revelation, and Revelation is the ultimate wrap-up. The enemy is defeated, God is enthroned, and man with him, those that are born again. Those that are evil remain evil, he says. If you're evil, just stay evil. So what Don said is absolutely true. Some... God knows the end from the beginning. He's not choosing. He's just saying, I know some that are evil, they're just going to be evil. They have no, there's no other way for them except hell. But some that are evil can be born again. They can be recreated. Amen? So that's just kind of where we're, what we're talking about here. And originally, there was uh, heaven and there was earth. If you wanted one, you basically had to abandon the other. Amen? And through Jesus, the boundaries of heaven and earth were breached. And the human being was empowered to fuse the two. That's what Adam was really doing, was bringing heaven to earth. He had this connection with God so that he could do on earth what God did in heaven. God gave him that authority. And it was to raise the earthly into a spirit realm that would then bring heaven down to earth. Amen? And through Jesus and the Word of God, we have been empowered to take physical objects and transform them into spiritual artifacts or testimonies or witnesses, whatever you, however you want to describe it. Amen? Religion before, before Jesus, it was literally, the job for religion was to enlighten the soul's information. Jews couldn't be born again. They just got more information. They got spiritual knowledge, right? So the job for religion was to enlighten the soul or to give the physical and the mental side of man more information about God and about his purpose and his plan. But ours is to transform the darkness of the material world into the light of heaven. That's what Jesus said when you, well, how, Jesus had to pray. He said, pray what's in heaven is on earth. In other words, let's not keep talking about the, not, the information that we have under Judaism, but let's actually do something with it. Let's make it a reality. Let's make the word more than just more information and, and more intellectual understanding. Let's literally turn it into actions. Praise the Lord. So look at John Chapter 1 and verse 14. The Word became flesh. So the Word always was, because the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then the Word was made flesh, right? So the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Word of God. All right, look at John 10, 10. Chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I'm come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. So the enemy comes for this purpose. His purpose is to, is to create chaos again, to, re, to destroy the earth, to bring it back into a, a form that can't produce anything for God, that is dis, just destructive. Amen? That's what we're seeing. Ultimately, that's what they want. I don't care how they come up with some war. They'll come up with some idiotic way of getting a war going here. I mean, that's what people do since, since Cain and Abel. So he said the thief comes for one purpose, to kill, to steal, and destroy. Right? So let me give you some, a metaphor here. Egypt was a type of Satan. 
right? And he enslaved or he took captive the children of Israel. He did it on a, on a, on a physical level, on a spiritual level, and on an emotional levels. They were totally in bondage. They weren't just prisoners. They were emotional prisoners. They were mental prisoners. They were physical prisoners, spiritual prisoners. Amen? And here's what God did. He designs the plagues to bring freedom on all three of those levels. And what I'm saying is what the crap we're seeing here, God's going to use it, and he's going to use it for his glory, and he's going to use it for our benefit. And anybody who doesn't get on board deals with the plagues and the consequences. Amen? So in Jesus, the word of God, we can experience freedom and transformation. For example, the plagues of the locusts, and you can use every one of them, but I'm just going to focus on the one right here for the time being. The plague of the locust, on an, on an emotional level, represents a perverted mind, a corrupt mind, a corrupt way of thinking, right? The locust consumed all of the crops, all of the greenery, you could say, in Egypt, right? Well, greenery in Jewish thinking is associated with Mount Sinai and the Word of God or the Torah, where the, where the Word was given, right? So in Jewish teaching and tradition, the Lord miraculously transformed the barren desert around Mount Sinai into a green, for, uh, fertile area. And look at, let's uh, look at Genesis 34, verse 3, just to validate this. So their, their tradition is that it was all desert, and we know that it was. They were in the desert. But Mount Sinai, around Mount Sinai, God turned that into a fertile green area. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any reason for him to say, don't let the cattle or any of the animals come over here and eat. Right? So he says, his soul clave unto... No, that's not it. I want Exodus 34, verse 3. I don't know what I said, but Exodus is what I wanted. You're supposed to be able to read my mind. Come on. <laughs> Work with me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all of the mount, neither let the flocks nor the herds feed before that mount. So apparently that they were drawn to the mount because there was grass. There was greenery there for them, and obviously that's why the animals, he said, don't let any of the men or humans come around there, but don't let any of the flocks or the, the, the beasts come there either to feed. Okay? So the tradition for Jewish people to remember this miracle and what they do to, to remember it, we're talking about uh, uh, putting up memorials, and this is one of their memorials, the way they remember this, this miracle, of, of fertility around the, around the Mount uh, 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 of uh, Sinai was uh, they would remember this miracle. They would decorate their homes, they do today, and synagogues with greenery on the festival that we call Pentecost or they call Shavuot, which is the giving of the Torah when, uh, on Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the commandments, right? The way they, one of the way they remember this is by decorating their homes and the synagogues with greenery, with, with ferns and you know, shrubbery and whatever. And so the Torah, or the Word of God, is represented by greenery because truth renews the mind. Okay? And so locusts eating the greenery symbolically represents corrupting our intellect. All right? It's, it's uh, perverting our minds with false beliefs, with lies. Yeah. Amen? So like the locust, a perverted mind, a corrupt mind, can uproot spiritual truth and moral foundations. It's what we're seeing in the world today. is exactly what Don was talking about. All of us have been yeah. talking about the same thing, calling good evil, evil good, telling you, you know, you're a girl, you can be a guy, you can do, you know, just have an operation and, you know, whatever. Just, it's insanity. It can lead to this extreme, which is what we're seeing in, in, in much of the media and in the government, intellectualism that denies any absolute truth. In other words, your truth doesn't, isn't necessarily my truth. It might be stealing a car to you, but to me it was just providing a need. I mean, I, ha I don't have a car. And they got two. That's not right. 
Surely I should be able to have one of them. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds insane, but the truth is we've got judges that are actually letting people out of prison yeah. and not prosecuting him yeah. for the very things that we're talking about. Yeah. Now, if that isn't demonic prophecy, yeah. I don't know what is. Anyway, that kind of mindset, that kind of thinking declares all morals and truth are relative. In other words, it's not wrong to be a thief if you have a big need. It's not wrong to murder if you get angry enough, if somebody does something, right, that irritates you. It denies the existence of the one true God and His commandments. How do, how do you defeat the locus of corrupted thinking and then find freedom? We've got to renew our minds with the truth of God's word. Yes. Israel needed physical freedom, but they also needed the truth of God's word that was given on Mount Sinai. Yes. They needed to be set free, but they needed more than just to be free. They needed to have some way of understanding how to live free. And so God gave them the word. So think about it. The Ten Plagues and the Ten Commandments are completely bound together. They're like one thing. They both relate to the other. Truth and transformation. Amen? Uh, look at John 8, verse 32. John 8, 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Yes. It wasn't just getting them out of Egypt. They needed to be free yes. after they got out of Egypt. They, their minds needed to be free. They had been held captive. Their souls had been held captive. Their thinking, their, their way of dealing with life had to be set free as well as their physical being. Their spirits had to be set free. Amen? The battle though, was always for the mind. If you can control the mind, you can control their actions and their behavior. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing, all the propaganda, all the lies, all the, the complicity between the government and the pharmaceutical companies and the, and the, the uh, media. Praise the Lord. I'm not, I'm not saying you don't get a shot. I, that's not my point. My point is this will never end because there's billions of dollars to be made and the government is in 50-50 with the pharmaceutical companies. They've, they've admitted it. Which leads me to believe that every time they tell you you need something, you may not necessarily need it. They just want more money. We're getting free masks that don't do you any good. Because they don't stop viruses. They stop, if you spit, It'll stop the spit. It'll stop you from slobbering on somebody or drooling on somebody. But it won't stop your, bre your breath from getting through it. If you don't believe me, put a mask on and breathe on your glasses and it'll fog up. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Free. Free mask. Believe me. Let me just make something really plain to you if you just fell out of a tree or something. Nothing is free. Somebody's paying for it, and that somebody is you and me. Oh, thanks, Joe, for the billions of dollars with a free mask that I'm paying for. Yeah. It's like, it's like the, the, the Christmas with Chevy Chase, you know. His brother-in-law is this complete jerk and, and leech, you know. And, he, and he, the, Chevy takes him out shopping to get Christmas gifts for his kids. And he said, and he, he tells you what he wants, this and this. And then, 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 the, then the guy says, oh, and by the way, Chevy, whatever his name was, he said, get yourself something really nice, too. Yeah, yeah from me. You're paying for it, but get, get something really good. I mean, get, don't, don't hold back the price. That's our government. And that's how idiotic it is. They made a stupid movie, an insane, crazy movie with Christmas trees with squirrels and old men setting fire to the house and everything. We're laughing at it. That's our government for crying out loud. I mean, I'm looking for Joe to come out with a little squirrel on his shoulder. Praise the Lord. Oh, you're getting too political. Look.
You think, what do you suppose the Jews were saying yeah. and the Egyptians were saying when, when the plagues were coming? Oh, God's getting too political. I mean, he's choosing one political group over another, over this, this yeah. government, over another government. Praise the Lord. Romans 12, 2. I'm sorry I can get on a rant. I, I, <laughs> hallelujah. I just, it's just, I mean, I, I have to laugh sometimes, because Sally's always, she'll say, did you see that? I say, no, I didn't see it. I don't want to know about it. I don't even care. I, I don't want to know. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Bless her heart. That's what you said. That's what you used to say when we lived in Texas. For somebody who's not quite, bless their heart. <laughs> Just think, see, I, you think I don't have courage? I'm going to eat the meal that she prepares today. <laughs> Take some guts. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. God wants to free us from lies. He wants to free us from corrupt thoughts. Jesus came to redeem not only our spirits, but our minds and our souls. We can't let the locust devour our thoughts. See, that's the thing about the devil. He, he always does everything the same. He's always coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Praise the Lord. Look at Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. This is, this is encouraging. This should be encouraging to us. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. God's going to restore everything that the government and this bogus propaganda machine is trying to steal from us. Praise the Lord. We've got to stand firm. We've got to declare the word of the Lord, the promises of God. We've got to do it today. We've got to do it tomorrow. We've got to do it as long as we're here. That's what we need to be doing. Yes. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, 23 through 25. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25. Twenty three through twenty five. Thank you, Jesus. First Peter one, twenty three through twenty five. One. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. First Peter one. 23 through 25, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It's greenery. It's renewing. Amen. The natural stuff will fade away. It'll die. It'll wither. But this, the Word of God, will renew. Yes. Praise the Lord. John 6, verse 63. John 6, 63. Praise the Lord. It is the Spirit that quickens or gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. They are renewing. They are living. Amen. There is a spirit life in the words that you speak. There's life in it. It's more than just words. It's literally loosing life or death. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, God said. Amen. Words carry spiritual forces. Words transmit fear. Words transmit faith. Now, these news networks are not... Christian. They're not biblical. But they're using the principles that the Bible teaches. They're speaking words of fear. They're speaking words of death. They're scared. They're trying to get people into bondage. Yeah. 
They're, don't tell me that they're not cooperating with the enemy. Whether they know it or not is irrelevant. Right. Words also transmit faith. God's words transmit God's image. The word was with God, the word was God. Amen. The devil's words transmit the devil's image. And our words transmit our image, whether it's demonic or godly. The words that you say, they're, 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 either, they're either corrupt words or they're righteous words. Luke chapter 1, 12 through 15. <clears throat> Luke 1, 12 through 15. We get to thinking that this, you know, the word of faith or speaking words, it's kind of a gimmick or it's just a, a program or a plan. No, it's the word of God. It's, it's how it works. Jesus is the word of God. That ought to tell us something. Amen? When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled. This was an angel came with the word of God. And he came to Zacharias. And fear fell on Zacharias when he saw the angel, and he was troubled by it. It's 12 through 15. Okay, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Verse 18. And Zacharias said unto the angel, How am I supposed to know this? How am I supposed to believe this? Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man. My wife is well stricken in years. How is this supposed to be real? How do I know you're telling me the truth? Give me a sign. See, he wasn't willing to receive the word of God without a sign. Luke chapter 1, 19 and 20. The angel answering said unto him, I'm Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. He said, you think I'm lying to you? I'm an angel who stands in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto you and to show you these glad tidings. Behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. They weren't his words. He didn't originate those words. He was just the, the transmitter of those words. He was just the carrier. Amen? So God knew that if he didn't shut the mouth of Zechariah, his word wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to come to pass. Because man has authority in this earth. Amen. God closed his mouth so he couldn't speak for a while until God's declaration came to pass. So Zacharias would not speak unbelief or corrupt speech. So there's times, and I've said this plenty of times, we've all talked about it and we've all said it, I'm sure. There are times we need to just not say anything. Where the overwhelming is we are seeing something that looks so horrible, so crazy, so insane, we want to say something. If you don't have a word from God, the best thing you can do is don't say anything. Just keep quiet. Praise the Lord. There is spirit life in God's word. There is faith, a faith force. Amen. A spiritual power. And that power is capable of bringing to pass what God has said. If that weren't true, they'd just let him ramble on and say, I don't know how that can happen. We're old people, and, and you know, we've never had any kids, and, and you know, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, there's, it's impossible. It has to be received. It has to be conceived in the human heart. The word has to, you can't just say it because it's there. It has to be conceived. It has to be birthed in you. 
That's why hearing or, or faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. It's an ongoing process. It's a continuous process. It has to be conceived. Amen? 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It has to be conceived. It had to be conceived in Mary. Right? Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 29 and 30. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Praise the Lord. It's your words, spiritual forces that affect your world. Amen. You can use the word of God and your faith to change your world. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. That's how it's going to get done in this last day. Yes. The government's not going to fix it. They're as screwed up as everybody else is. I don't care if they're Democrat or Republicans. Yeah, there's probably some good Republicans, but there's a bunch of moron, rhino, whatever you want to call them, yes. that are just as evil and just as corrupt as the Democrats. Yes. And there are some decent Democrats that are trying to do the right thing at the risk of their own political career and everything else. Yeah. And we see them, the news, it's on the news. You can use the Word of God in your faith to change the world. It's the principle of God and the power of His Word over all matter. It's the way it began. It's the way it continues. It's God's method. And we are created in His image. And we are to operate by His principles. Yeah. Romans 10, 6 through 8. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend unto heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ from, again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. John 15, verse 7. And there's another way of looking at that, but it's, he's talking about bring Jesus down, bring Jesus up. He said the word's nigh you. Who is Jesus? He's the word. You have him. He's in your mouth. He's in your heart. That's what we need to be saying. If you abide in me, he's just basically saying what we just read in Romans. You don't have to call me down from heaven. I live in you. You don't have to call me up from beneath the earth. We are one. You abide in me and my words abide in you. You ask what you will and it will be done unto you. Now that doesn't mean... I want my neighbor's house. It means if we ask anything in agreement with his word, it's, it's accomplished. It's done. Amen? Ask anything of me. Who is he? He's the word. Yeah. Ask anything of the word. It's in agreement with the word. And it's yours if you not only say it, but have it in your heart. Yeah. Conceived. Yeah. And then when you speak it, it births that thing that has been conceived. Amen? If you abide in me, my words abide in you, right? All right, Matthew 12, 34 through 37. Matthew 12, 34 through 37. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. In other words, again, he's talking about if we get it conceived in our heart, it will automatically be the thing that we'll be saying. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Have faith. Yes. 
in, in the Word of God and then speak that Word because it's near you. It's, it's first in your mouth and then in your spirit. And it reminds me of like when, you were, when we were kids and, of course, you had phonics. There are lots of stuff that they don't teach it today. The old flashcards. You said it so many times until it just became a reaction. You didn't even need to think. You just see the sign go, you know, the little card go up, four, two is six. You know, it's not like you became a mathematical genius. It's just it got into your heart that it was natural for it to be the first thing that would come out of your mouth. Amen? 1 Peter one twenty three through 25. But you have to be disciplined. You've got to not just say crap because it's in you emotionally. That it comes to your mind, the first thought in your mind is, oh my God, look at that. No, just tap the brakes. Think before you say stuff. Because your words have power. We, we're talking a lot of the junk we talk. We're talking like we don't think there's any power to them at all. That's what the devil wants you to believe. That's how he holds you captive. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which is incorruptible seed, obviously, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man is a flower, grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, falls away. The word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It's constantly renewed. Amen. Amen. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21. Now this isn't going to, it may sound on the surface like I'm contradicting Tammy, but I'm not. I, I want you to listen carefully to how I say this. We have all, so a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what we talked about at the very beginning. You're either speaking prophecy from God or you're speaking prophecy from the enemy. And most of what we're hearing outside of church and outside of our relationship with other believers is demonic prophecy. It's called propaganda, and it's lies to bring us into bondage, to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.16. Praise the Lord. Try to speed up here. Hallelujah. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. <clears throat> For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And these are the disciples that are talking about what they saw on the Mount Transfiguration. How many of you figure if you had been there, you wouldn't have had to ask what Zacharias act, asked? Show me something that will, you know, cause me to believe what you said, Right? But here's the deal, the revelation of Jesus. The thing that, that, that Peter received that day on that Mount of Transfiguration was as fresh as, as it was the day it happened when he wrote this. What was revealed to Peter that day on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration changed his life so dramatically that years later he gave his life knowing Jesus even prophesied to him that he would die this death. Knowing what was coming, it didn't hinder him. It didn't alter his life or his faith or his, his, what he was going to do at all. That thing was dramatic. It, it, he spoke of the event as if it had just happened. And then he goes on to say, as great, now here's the point, as great as the experience was, something else remained that was more dependable for him and everybody else to build their lives and their faith on. A more sure word of prophecy. So yes, it's important what our grandchildren see and our children see in us. But what's even more important is that they hear the word of God. 
more sure word of prophecy. What is he saying? The more sure word of prophecy is the word of God. We hear prophets all the time and thank God for them. But there's one way I can always test the prophet. Let's go back to the word of God. It's a more sure word. It's always accurate. It's always the truth. A more sure word of prophecy. You do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place, he said. Amen. Peter was telling us, as wonderful as the experience was, as fantastic as that whole thing was on the mountaintop, it was still a fleeting experience. How many of you have had a miracle and then faced a conflict? The miracle fades. It, it, it's dimmer. You know what I mean? You have, to, you have to resurrect it. You have to bring it back in order for it to have the impact that it has. The Word of God is a light that shines in the darkness. Amen? In other words, if Peter had to choose which is the most important, the experience or the Scripture, the choice had already been made. God's Word carries more weight and authority than my experience. A more sure word. Amen? Nothing compares to absolute, unchanging truth of God's Word. A light that shines in a dark place. That word light that's used there, the word light shineth, is in a present active tense, meaning it's, it's continuous, it's ongoing, always there, always doing the same thing, always lighting up. The light of God's word drives away spiritual darkness, which is why demonic forces hate the light yep. and the light bearers. Yep. Praise the Lord. 2 Peter 1.19 It's a light that shines in darkness. You don't have to go there, Mike. I'm saving time. You have to let the Word of God, the light of the Word, shine its light until the day dawn. This is another way of saying it's in your mouth and it'll be in your heart. You say it until the day dawns and the day star arises in your heart, until that truth becomes a, re- a reality to you. Tell it's not just hopes and, and prayers and dreams and hope maybe it'll happen. I, I'm saying it until it rises up in me. Like the day star is Jesus. It's also the sun that lights up everything, right? So it's, it's like if I keep saying it long enough, Jesus comes alive. Jesus is actually activated through my words. He becomes real. It's not just a, a, a religious activity. Amen. Peter is describing a picture of a morning sunrise that dispels the darkness of night. Think about it. When the sun's light first appears, I get up really early in the morning, most of the time anywhere between 4.30 and and 6 o'clock. You say, well, geez, you're energetic. No, I just can't sleep, praise the Lord. (laughs) But, But I might as well be up. So I get up and I see the sunrise nearly every morning. Amen. And I and think about it. The light first appears over the horizon. And that light is very dim at first. It's just, just you can see it, and that's about all you could say. But as the sun rises higher in the sky, that light grows brighter until the darkness is completely eliminated altogether. And it's like, how did that happen? I mean, it's, it's, I know how it happens you know, naturally, but it's just in your mind you think, God, it was so weird. It was so dark, and 30 minutes later, It's perfectly bright out. So when the word first comes to us, the light begins to shine, but it's just a dim distance, horizon kind of light. But the more it's believed, that light becomes more widespread, and the darkness is transformed. That word day star refers to the shining light of the sun. The sun is a star. I talked about it briefly last week. It's a star. But it's a day star because it's so close to the earth that we call it the sun. But if we were a few billion miles further away, it would just be another star in the dark. So that day star is a shining light of the sun and its ability to entirely eliminate darkness. Psalms 57 verse 8. And I'm going to wrap up here. Psalms 57 and verse 8. I'm going to show you what God is saying to us. We are the light of the world, right? Let your light shine. Where does that light come from? Jesus is the light. 
but he's in us. And we have to let him out. This is what Tammy was talking about, is what all of us have been yeah. sharing, right? We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Psalms 57, verse 8. Wake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and harp. I myself will awake early. There's a translation for this, and that translation says, I will awake the dawn. Sometimes I think I'm doing that. You know, I get up really early, and I'm thinking, well, if it wasn't for me, you know, because I know I've got on my phone, I've got that little app, the weather app, and it tells you what time the sun comes up and what time it sets. And, and of course, it, we're getting, the days are getting longer every, every day. You know, you see another minute or so pops up there. But anyway, it's almost like I have some control over this because I'm up early enough to see the whole thing happen. I know that's irrational, but so am I. Uh, but it just, the, the translation is, I, it's, I mean, it's kind of, th I'm thinking that's what he's thinking. You know, I'm up, I'm watching this, I have some control over it. But I will awake the dawn. How do you wake the dawn? I mean, why is it dark in the first place? Because it's night. Not really. It has nothing to do with time. Now, we think of night as a period of time, and, and I know in a sense it is, but night isn't so much a period of time as it is a state of being. It isn't dark because it's nighttime. It's nighttime because it's dark. We ought to know that. Here, we've got daylight savings time. We manipulate the time all the time. But the reality is that night's still going to show up, right? It isn't the time that makes it dark. It's the dark that controls the time. Yes. Right. Psalms 112, verse 4. Unto the upright there ariseth a light in the darkness. He's gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Night, just think about it this way. We know the rotation and all. Night is the effect of the earth turning away from the light of the sun. Night is the earth dwelling in its own shadow. God is light. His word is light. So when you turn away from God's word, you move into the shadow and you create the night. You create your darkness. When you turn from his presence, his truth, his light, night comes into your life. And when you turn from his truth and away from his love, darkness comes to your heart. It comes to your spirit. It comes to your emotions. You end up dwelling in your own shadow. We're human. By nature, fallen. But by the spirit, born again. If we let our flesh dominate us, we live in our own shadow. We live in the fears of our own weaknesses, our own uh, inabilities. We dwell in our own shadow, in the shadow of our turning, turning from God to CNN. <laughs> oh, God, if I don't get letters or something horrible from this, I'll be very surprised and think nobody's listening. Anyway, we're turning from government or turning from God to government. And we wonder why it's so dark. That's the night. So what's the dawn? Dawn is when the earth turns away from the darkness and back to the sun. Second Peter 1.19, till the day star dawn, we won't go there, Mike, I'm sorry. Till the day star dawns in your heart, right? You cause a sunrise. When you turn away from darkness, you turn away from what is not God, what is not truth. You turn away from your shadow back to the light of God's word. You don't have to wait for the dawn. You can cause the dawn. Romans 13, 12, and we'll wrap with this. Romans 13, verse 12. That's what he's talking about. 
you can cause that day star to dawn by the word of God, by a more sure word of prophecy, by the word that is conceived in the heart that gives birth. It can birth the dawn. It can bring the light. Amen? We are the light of the world. How are we going to bring light into this darkness? Right there. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. You can make the day star. You can make the day star shine. You have the day star dwelling in you. The sunrise, you have the power to cause a sunrise. You have the power, and we'll just, you know, use some language here, but you have the power to cause the S-O-N, sun, to rise. You have resurrection life. It's the word of God. The son of righteousness dwelling in us. The devil is darkness. But he's not to be feared. We have the light. And we can, we can cause that light to shine wherever and whenever we want it to. We can cause a sunrise anywhere at any time. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I'm telling you, church, we've got the victory. We just got to not Confess defeat. Just keep saying what we know to be true. And that light's going to shine in darkness and cause it to flee. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. Have a great week. Appreciate your time and patience this morning. Love the Lord and let your light shine. In Jesus' name. Amen.